Welcome to the final episode of our Descent into Midnight series, everyone. We're going to plunge into some deep discussion here, so buckle up and get ready right after these announcements. Ugh. <laughs> it's my birthday. I can do what I want. Okay, everyone, it's Ryan's birthday, so I'm going to let those puns go <laughs> this time. Thank you. I, I, I believe this might be the last series, quote unquote, not really, um, that I will be doing puns, so... Yes, I would like to say yes. <laughs> it is the last time. <laughs> we'll see how many I can sneak in. You didn't ever say. First and most importantly, if you haven't heard the news yet, One Shot Podcast Network show, Asians Represent, has been nominated for the Podcast Any Award. Also, former guests of the show, Senda and Andy, have been nominated for She's a Super Geek, which is another fantastic show out in the world. We will put a link in the show notes for you to head over and vote. Uh, there's lots of different categories, and you can kind of put them in order, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't have to pick just one to vote for. Yep. Um, but if you can head over and do that before the voting closes, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love both of these shows, and uh, they are very, very deserving. And uh, we really hope to unseat, uh, I don't even know, the podcast that has won the past X years in a row. I think it's Ken and Robin talk about stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so let's vote for them. Uh, the uh, Asians represent, and she's a super geek, and try to get them to the top because... Because uh, they deserve it, gosh darn it. They deserve it. Absolutely. And uh, don't forget, Gen Con is coming up soon. Uh, so sign up for our panel for tons of fun with Grant Howitt and James D'Amato, if you haven't already. Uh, links are also in the show notes. Uh, and also I am sad to report that my games at Chimera are still not available to sign up for. Uh, it is less than three weeks away and I am getting nervous about that, but, uh, we will keep you posted as soon as they are ready. It's review time! Woo! Review time! We need a song for that too. <laughs> we love reviews. And we also love this one from Easy Peasy from the United States on iTunes, titled, Very Good, 5 Out of 5, Would Listen Again. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to the character creation cast since its inception. Every episode introduces me to a new system or actual play podcast I should be checking out, Blades in the Dark and the Magpies being a prime example. I also really appreciate the character evolution casts, where Amelia and Ryan break from their normal format to discuss tips and tricks for players to improve their gaming experience. Thank you for all you do. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also thank you for and listening. And also thank you, yes. <laughs> and for the review. It was really, really nice reading that. Thank you so much. Yeah. I love when we get them in our inbox. Like, it really does make our day. Like, it I really like does. Like, I get a message from Ryan that's like, hey, look it, we got a review. Yep. Yeah, people are so nice. <laughs> I know, it's so fun because I, I've got it separated out in Gmail and I can see that little number ticking up. It's very good. It is very nice. So, so thank you very much. Um, and with all of that out of the way, here's the episode. Yeah, enjoy. discussion episode. Last time, we created a unique group of characters for Descent into Midnight. This episode, we'll be discussing the character creation process and building our community. We're really excited to welcome back Richard and Taylor from the design team for Descent into Midnight. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves and uh, remind everybody where they can find you and what you did with your character last time? Yeah, so uh, I am Richard Kreutz Landry. I am an origami artist and a software developer, and I'm working on Descent into Midnight with Taylor and Rich Howard. And uh, oh, I totally forgot. Yeah, I need to actually talk about the character, don't I? Yeah, you do. Well, let's see here then. Tell us about Shelley. All right, so uh, the terribly named Shelley uh, is a. A collection of um, 
discarded clam shells uh, in the physical world uh, made up of basically Amelia's character's family, uh, which is not uh, terrifying at all. <laughs> um, they live halfway between the physical world and the Echo, and uh, they have been um, watching their kin essentially uh, disappear as their connection to the physical world has been severed for uh, some reason. We haven't quite found out how that's happening or why. Uh, and that's important because the connection that they have with the physical world uh, is actually important to keeping it from being encroached upon by uh, this void that... Um, Ryan's character uh, is uh, keeping at bay, I guess. Right? Was that the no Taylor? Taylor's the bubble. Oh, okay. It was it was Taylor's character. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so Shelley's uh, kin have been disappearing, and their connection has been severed with the physical world, um, which is important because part of what's happening is as they do that, and as they disappear into the deep echo the physical world's walls are being pushed back. That's not terrifying. I'm no, sure it's fine. Not at all. Uh, their it's home, fine. yeah, their, their home is the boneyard because that's where they collect all their, their lovely clam shells uh, with the, the clams sort of being the equivalent of uh, living computer parts almost. Um, and... They have a couple of interesting moves uh, in the playbook. One of them is Heart of Violence uh, with the option Stormfront, where essentially they ask their friends to hold them back. And uh, whether their friends do or do not determines what interesting things happen from there. Uh, the other move is Hell's Heart, where they have... Um, sworn vengeance uh, upon a, a wrong that has been done them. And in this case, it is uh, their kin who are disappearing. And the consequence that they face is dangerous odds. And when they face dangerous odds because of the situation, they get cool bonuses. Nice. Very cool. Taylor, how about yourself? I would love to tell you about my character. So I am playing uh, a character named Bubs who is a seeker. I am gelatinous and genial because I am the uh, gelatinous membrane that separates our world from the Echo. Um, I make like weird illusional um, or illusory uh, avatars that I can, you know, tunnel through reality and act through. Uh, and I compromise the outer bubble of our bubble city. Um, I can project myself through the echo to like see glimpses of the future. Um, and I can, uh, you know, bring that, that vision into life. Oh, that's right. Because, um, Amaryllis, uh, they're the spirit that you can see is like the future of a piece of sand inside of them. That's going to become a pearl. Maybe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I'm very excited about that character. <laughs> awesome. And Amelia, why don't you tell us about your character? Sure. My character is Amaryllis. Um, I was playing the empath playbook. I say playing, like I'm going to do something with this. Um, <laughs> so I was a little clam oyster thing um, with a sort of pearlescent shell but also lots of teeth it was a bitey clam um <laughs> i like how uh your species probably all have the bitey teeth right oh i assume so so that means richard's clams yeah. are all bitey clams mm -hmm. that's even more mm -hmm. terrifying yeah absolutely um i am look i'm a princess it's fine um <laughs> we are we are i am the clam queen it's fine <laughs> it's good <laughs> Um, but part of what I am the bivalve queen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Amazing. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so part of what the empath can do is kind of um, channel the emotions of 
the other characters and kind of like soak them up and um, kind of soak up their corruption too, right? Oh, yeah. I haven't gotten to play this one yet, but. Um, and then the two moves that I pick. Let's see here. Um, lead by example. So when you endanger yourself by taking the lead, you can um, clear condition or help out teammates um, or learn something about yourself. Um, and then synchronicity. When you act as a team, you link your allies in a psychic landscape, allowing them to act as one synchronous being. I'm pretty excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm trying to remember like what all – we'll get to it when we get to our community stuff about all of our connections and our story and everything, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Ryan, do you want to tell us about your character? Absolutely. Uh, my character <laughs> was named That Which Exists Among All, but also Nowhere, or Tweeban for short. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tweeban exists uh, along the entire uh, like physical surface of this entire planet. Um, and they are basically there to help amplify the echo harmoniously for the inhabitants of the world. Um, But the entire world was apparently comprised of completely in the echo until I created bubs uh, to create this environment for these physical things that were starting to form. I kind of imagine that water. Yeah, I kind of imagine creating this <laughs> this bubble of water with this mm-hmm. barrier and then these like things that were like proto life eventually mm-hmm. grew into the complex life forms that are there now. So that's kind of cool. Um and I took uh some moves on the specialist, so I took some moves to help the team out uh safety net so when uh, things go bad if an ally rolls a six minus on a basic move. I can mark a condition myself and make that roll a ten plus. Um, and not on my watch, uh, which means uh, I'm an expert at defending the innocent and using my surroundings to my advantage. So um, I can create advantages for my allies, which is really cool. Yeah, that's me. I'm excited. Uh huh. This is the good part. This is the good mm-hmm. part. So, not that the rest of it wasn't also good, but this is a good part. <laughs> so, uh, how about we uh, create a place? Let's create our community. All right. Let's make a place. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to send you that song by Amelia. Oh, okay. Uh, I have it. Oh, you do? Never mind. <laughs> All right. Um, so, basically, the way that the uh, city building works. Is a series of questions. Um, we are going to all kind of pitch in for each of these, and we'll see what comes up. Um, the first question is, what is a unique natural feature, neighborhood, or district in the city? Let's go with, like, the most mundane thing. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, yeah, no, honestly, let's. yeah, because, like... Well, it's it's so like the setting itself that we've sort of surrounded it with is so oh, outlandish yeah. that I think it could really help ground it. Um, and don't worry, it'll turn into something weird and wonderful, I'm sure. <laughs> I think it's like a grocery store. Okay, so what does what does a, a I'm trying place... to think of like the most mundane thing in a mm-hmm. in a place where you live? Like, I mean. I don't, okay. They don't have so, a store. Maybe I don't know if it's ca- like capitalism. Okay. <laughs> so um, what ab- I'm what trying about to think of mundane so things. Fish so what about the what about the like equivalent of a Seven Eleven in a reef? What does that look like? Like what's what's the thing that has a little bit of everything that you need? Maybe it's not maybe the best, but it's close. It's like a travel plaza. Okay. So it's you know some sort of like hub between. I think it's probably like toward the edge of town, but mm-hmm. it's kind of a hub between other places that you would want to go outside of our little community. Okay. And so it's this little stopping point to rest. It's our little rest stop. So we've got a we've got an entire kingdom effectively here. If you're the queen, Amelia. 
But I don't know how fish monarchies work. Well, that, that's that's where we make it up, right? Well, I know. I'm just saying that doesn't mean that it has to be like a whole huge thing. I can be a queen of six people. That's true. Mm. Okay. So we have this sort of meeting place. It sounds like there's probably like a little bit of food there. Um, so some sort of uh, plants that grow. Mm-hmm. Um, it's where, uh, you know, uh, adolescent fish might hang out after uh, after they've been, you know, downloading the latest um, educational uh, lessons psionically from the clam computers. Um <laughs> It's a talk run by dolphins, and it's just called a podcast. Oh my god! Yes, <laughs> please, one hundred percent. So that is that is one hundred percent a thing. Um, so, what makes this particular place special? Why is it the thing that people know about? I think it is the only one for a significant distance. Okay. So we get a lot of other creatures coming through there because it is the only kind of option. Um, but it's also sort of by default then the hub of culture in the area mm-hmm. because it's kind of the only place where things are coming in and out. Okay. so Because it's... I think we're kind of isolated otherwise if everything else is far away. Interesting. Okay. So what's the, um, what is the thing that is isolating the city from everything else that this is sort of like the, at the, the entrance or exit point to the city? Um, we talked a little bit about, uh, bub being named for bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so is bub Taylor, um, you said sort of, oh, surrounding the city? Yeah, I think so. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that. So if, if bub is sort of surrounding the city, um, and, and they are these bubbles, like tell us a little bit more about that, um, keeping in mind that we have the the rest stop as sort of this entrance and exit to the city. Yeah. So Bub is the membrane between our world and the Echo. Mm-hmm. He's not like an impermeable mm-hmm. membrane between like different states. So like I feel like people probably pass through him and like around him pretty well. Um, so like... Is that- and I, I think you could probably see the membrane... And folks who are, like, more tuned to the Echo itself can probably perceive that clearer. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I don't think that there's any... Like, he's not impeding Mm -hmm. access to this this place. Interesting. Okay, so... Is there, then, a bubble around each major city? Or... Yeah, Or is there one big bubble over all the cities? I like multiple individual bubbles Mm -hmm. for two reasons. One is just like Mm -hmm. pure aesthetics, but then the other is it lets me shout, I'm a (laughs) bubs! Awesome. I'm kind of picturing then traveling between Mm -hmm. each cities because the echo sounds like it's, like the pure echo sounds like it might be dangerous for pure physical beings, right? Ooh, interesting, right? Because it's like encroaching and these are... So I'm picturing when beings travel through Mm -hmm. uh to different cities i create micro bubbles around them as they travel along the the floor to keep them safe so it's so it's like we're living underwater on the surface of mars or something where it's like it's not that the water itself is dangerous it's that without the protection from the like uh pure echo yeah Oh man, that is that's see mm-hmm. started with with underwater Seven Eleven, and here we go. <laughs> yep. All right. Um. So we have bubble tunnels. I'm imagining these bubble tunnels being like you know highways, like inter interstate highways that are there's nothing for hundreds of miles or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you just have to travel from place to place. Interesting. So. Do we think that, like, is it that these are, like, the the sapient creatures have sort of put together this system and found these points where, like, Bub is strongest to build the cities? Um, I want to say that Bub was created 
around the strongest points. Okay. And the cities, the yeah, cities like naturally that. grew up in those spots. It's interesting though, because I think that part of what we're talking about is that the echo is kind of like starting to like encroach on things. Yeah. And so you wouldn't necessarily need the bubbles until like recently. Have they always been like that just because, or is this sort of a new phenomenon that th- we've even had to use those? I think the bubbles hold back the echo. The echo's natural state is completely along the surface of the world. Whereas these bubbles were created to have pockets of just pure water that keep everything living inside of it living. Once the... So it's the echo always unsafe and now it's just unsafer? Yes. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. Interesting. Gotcha. Okay. And so like the, the creatures that are living in the physical world, like they sort of grew here and like the for a while everything was all right like oh cool we've you know we have this like pocket that is a physical world and now it's starting to revert back and this is like a long ongoing struggle that has been going on and and that's where bub came from yeah Mm -hmm. interesting okay i'm thinking like um back when it all started Mm -hmm. it was probably like bits and pieces of organic matter here and there across the world. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I, I've been existing since then. And I said, I need to protect this new thing. So then I started creating the bubbles. And as the things grew, I made the bubbles bigger. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it got to a point where I couldn't make any more bubbles because there's, there's just too many or too big. Mm Mm-hmm. Also Mm -hmm. because the bubbles are, like, their own beings now, too. So you can't just, like, control other beings. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Underwater 7-Eleven and we come up with this. Okay. Um, So from there, uh, let's talk a little bit about a sapient species that lives uh, in this world uh, other than the ones that make up this world. So I think, honestly, like, Ryan and Taylor, your your characters are obviously, like, pretty much unique. Um, mm-hmm. And mine, I think, are sort of weirdly in the Echo um and anchored here um so i think really the only the only restriction we have is is not a clam yep yeah (laughs) okay not a clam not a bitey clam yes not a bitey clam so i mean we do know that there are dolphins with a podcast right so okay right yeah let's talk about them all right um so yeah let's let's talk about them a little bit um what's a cultural tradition that they have um and I, i'd say let's let's talk about something from before um the the bubble cities formed uh when they had sort of free reign of the oceans and then let's once we have that we can talk about how that has changed now i think that they have a strong tradition of oral histories i think that's part of why they make these podcasts okay yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> okay. They are sort of the storytellers of this world. Mhm. Mhm. So like what um what does it look like as they tell these stories? Like what's the what form does that take or has it taken in the past? Does it um I want to say it works in harmony with uh bubs projections and my sound manipulation okay maybe at like these amphitheater type places where they'll be able to uh speak the stories and then uh it's kind of like this whole performance art thing where projections are created based upon the stories to tell a visual interpretation as well oh interesting Mm -hmm. i feel like i was thinking something close but slightly different i feel like somehow 
the way that they convey this sound also stimulates a sort of I- imagery mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. your brain. So even if you aren't watching this performance or something, hearing it is enough to like trigger the imagery well, I think that's, too. We can tie the echo yeah. into mm-hmm. it. Like if they're using echolocation for it, it could potentially like create an image that is quote unquote mm-hmm. real in the same way that I can create an image that's quote yeah. unquote real. Mm-hmm. So is it like is it like augmented reality for them then where it's like they yeah. see it just but it's not actually there if you're not experiencing this? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think about have you ever heard of there's like a oh gosh, I'm trying to think about how to explain it, but there are things that they can do for people who are blind um that like actually like stimulate their taste buds that also like stimulates certain parts of the brain to like trigger imagery as well mm. it's crazy and i feel like it's something kind of like that that like interesting you can so it's stimulate like, using... like a certain part of the brain that okay. like also triggers these other things so it's okay, all so it's... it's all internal mm-hmm. so it's well it's something that like they are able to project sounds that like coupled with like a connection with the echo maybe like can tap into the senses of whatever hears them and like allow them to experience the stories Mm -hmm. right but i think it's like important to me that however Mm -hmm. it's done um the imagery is triggered in like a very personal way so that Mm -hmm. you and i are not necessarily seeing the same thing Mm. okay yeah interesting i like that okay so uh ryan i know you'd mentioned amphitheaters um Mm -hmm. And I, I like the concept of that. But what I was thinking is, um, like, in in our oceans, there's, you know, the SOFAR channel, mm-hmm. um, which is basically, like, this, this temperature band, essentially, where, like, the sound bounces off of the, the, the like, change in density or whatever between um like different layers of the ocean that are different um temperatures and and densities or whatever and it's like a little tunnel essentially where it just keeps bouncing back and forth the sound keeps going Mm -hmm. and it can go for you know hundreds thousands of miles it'd be really interesting if like instead of like an amphitheater like you think of it you know as a human being like it would be like a a space somewhere in the water that that is like um like if you go to a a an opera house or something mm-hmm. if you stand in the middle of the stage you know and you say something yeah. you can hear it everywhere and it's almost like that with um with these amphitheaters and it's like that yep. um different spots in the water what if that plus these like so far channel type things are mm-hmm. transmitting it through the echo and it not only hits the civilization that we're in but it gets Mm -hmm. to other civilizations like oh you know what about like i know shelly right is from a a species of of creatures that live partly in the echo and have sort of anchored themselves to this physical world like Mm -hmm. maybe that's what called them here yeah interesting Okay, but here's the thing. Here's okay. here's the thing. Uh, um, right. Because this is, like, encroaching on everything, mm-hmm. is it now distorting the sounds and images? Yeah. And they are, like, starting to get creepy. I think, yes, I absolutely. think we just found our corruption. Like, I super, mean... super creepy imagery because of mm-hmm. the, like... Yeah, let's throw down a corruption token yeah. on that. Yeah, that is. So if we had a, a map here, we'd be drawing a, a, a an amphitheater, I guess, basically just like a circle or something mm-hmm. somewhere in the water, and we would be dropping a corruption token on that 100%. Okay. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, and I think that also kind of answers um, sort of how it started to change as, uh, as Gridger's movement have been more restricted uh, inside of the bubble cities and the bubble uh, highways. Um, all right. I wonder uh, if I wonder if that's the reason why my hold on these bubbles is starting to falter, is because 
when people use these amphitheater type locations, I have mm -hmm. to do special stuff to keep the sound more localized. Interesting. Okay. To keep like too much of the, the pure echo from getting into it. Yeah. Ooh. All right. Um, I think we've got a good start. So what's a, uh, a non-sapient species that inhabits this world? Um, it could be domesticated or, or otherwise. We know we have uh, the clams and we know we have these dolphin-like creatures. What else lives here? I like tiny little krill. Ooh, yeah, I was, right. I was thinking about the same sort of thing, but I didn't have the word for it. <laughs> All right. Um, so what do they, what do they do? What purpose do they serve within the community? I don't think that they do. They're like, not that they're like mosquitoes mm -hmm. and they're pests, but they're just like around. Okay. And I think like we could definitely, we could explore like what the corruption ends up, like how it's affecting them and sort of how that like spreads out to other parts of the ecosystem maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah all right um so i think we've talked about this actually a little bit uh an aspect of infrastructure for the city such as transportation uh trader emergency services so we've definitely got the um the bubble highways um so where like how do we think that like does everything not everything can live inside of the the bubble cities right not everything can live inside of the the tubes of bubbles that that allow um transportation between the two places um so building on that like what do we think it's like outside of those spaces i think uh outside the bubbles themselves yeah. i think i want to say desert and death like interesting th oh, things good. that that go out of the bubble protection mm -hmm. don't last too long it's kind of like those uh underwater uh like salt zone salt lake mm -hmm. zones yeah. um where it's just you're not going to last long if you get trapped in there cuz it's going there's there's nothing good there for you you can't breathe anything there mm -hmm. it's still a, a liquid that you can swim through Okay. But I think that there are no currents there. Yeah. Though. No, the no water's currents. just totally still. Yep. Oh, jeez. Okay. It's frightening. I want to say it's dark too. Mm-hmm. Okay. But but loud. Ooh. Like you get out there and it's like this otherworldly, even more otherworldly sound. Mm -hmm. Really? Because okay. I feel like if the water's still that it's like that, creepy quiet that's what, that's what makes it more creepy though oh. but i feel like you know like there's like that moment where when like a fan turns off or something that you're like okay it's almost like eerily quiet now like something's missing what, what if that what it what if it's that but if you concentrate real hard you'll get some like weird like am Feedback? i really am i really hearing something like some sort of weird it's like Sound. it's like the worst ringing in your ears that you've ever felt because yep. it's not in your ears; it's in your head. Yeah, but you you don't know it until you start concentrating to try to hear it. Okay, that. This but is, why would this you? Because you wouldn't go out there. Right. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is fine. This is all fine. <laughs> this is not like horrifying at all. This is why it's important that these bubbles are here. Mm hmm. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. We we are definitely getting into this and. In, uh in a place that's that's not having a good time all right um <laughs> so what is like what's a useful piece of biotechnology that we find um here in these cities to like help everyone survive because like it's clearly a much smaller like everything has to be contained within these small ecosystems essentially um that are protected from the stillness trying to think what you would need like what is a hmm. thing i'm wondering instead of something you need like 
a hobby that some people have taken up, like trying to um, explore the outsides of the bubble, since the bubbles are not impenetrable. Mm -hmm. Like maybe a piece of tech that lets you go out there for a bit. That's not a hobby. That's a death wish. <laughs> but it's like it's like going out to, or or I mean, like haunted yeah. houses, going to haunted houses and trying to investigate ghosts. You could say the same like thing that. about bungee jumping. Like like yeah. a thr- like a thrill seeking. Yes, that's what it is. It's haunted bungee jumping. Haunted, they go up yes. to the top, like haunted of bungee the bubble, jumping. and yeah, and then they jump off. Yep. So with the little kelp bubbles, with with it being like creatures that can swim like what if it's like it is a tether right there is some sort of physical tether that's more like a spacewalk yeah where it's like you swim out as far as you can and what if like it pulls at you yeah yes yep yeah (laughs) okay yeah so you have a tether and like you you have I'm also imagining like there's there's that um that thing with uh what's it called blue holes where it's like a super deep um narrow hole mm-hmm. in the ocean that that like the the it's only got just a tiny shallow area of water above it and then it's just a hole that bores down um into the floor of the ocean and so like there's not very much um movement and so like there's no oxygen that gets in and out of the water Mm -hmm. and so like it's just it's basically like that where it's like it's very still it's it can be you know it can be very dark in this case uh that's what we're saying but like there's just like hardly any life there um and in this case it pulls at you geez um i almost want like does nothing live out here or is there something that lives out here and like nobody can figure out why? I want to say at the very least there's echo creatures that are living out here. I think we don't know. We don't. I think that there are all sorts of superstitions and rumors, but nobody knows for sure. Interesting. And like the people who have, who have, what do we want to call it? Like, jumped Mm -hmm. i guess Mm -hmm. i guess jump is a good enough word as any but like the people who have jumped the furthest and come back like they come back with stories of things that clearly can't be true but like physically being touched when they get out there like brushed yeah yeah but But you can't see see anything anything. so you have no idea do you think like religions have cropped up around what might or might not be out there i would say almost certainly yeah there's got to be some cool, like, stillness cult. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a cult. The cult mm-hmm. of the stillness. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. And, and the really interesting thing about it, too, is that, like, because Bub and um, Tweebon are, like, in in the world, it's like, there is clearly, there are people who know what's going on, sort of, mm-hmm. like, to a certain extent. But it's also like, does that matter for, you know, a large portion of the population who are just like, you know, have this cultural memory of these open oceans that have now shrunk to just this space, you know, that they can barely venture into. Mm -hmm. And I think that like this corruption probably obscures anything that's out there, too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so so who knows? Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe the corruption has already started and this is just like, you know, the characters that we have like just can't perceive what's actually going on. Maybe there is, you know, maybe there is a safe world out there, but the corruption is like tainted everyone's perceptions of it. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Okay. Ooh. I like the idea that the spirit that lives inside of um, Amelia's character knows. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Yeah. This is all, or at least this the future of that spirit. No, <laughs> no big deal. Everything's fine. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, That's and why I, I love this and game. I think we established last time if the if the bubbles do collapse, that's the end of civilization. Yeah. Like, as, as we know it. Like yeah. That's... I'll be the only one still existing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would not be good. Uh-huh. So, um... 
let's let's talk one more thing. What's a prominent cultural, religious, or natural event that is important to the city and its inhabitants? So we've got the the storytelling dolphins. We have um, the the jumping that happens. But what's something else? Now, outside these bubbles is pretty much pitch darkness, right? Yeah. And I'm assuming that there's probably some bioluminescent things inside the bubbles. Yeah. Of course. Obviously. Um, what if periodically and like predictably there mm-hmm. is light storms that happen outside the bubble? Yeah. Interesting. So it's like an aurora borealis like or like something. flashes of yeah, light and it's from, beautiful from like the that. echo. Oh, geez, that's terrifying. Because, like, (laughs) where is that coming from? (laughs) Nothing lives out there. And that's where light comes from. Light comes from living things. And nothing can live out there. Yeah. Let's not think too hard about it. (laughs) What? Okay, I I have to ask the question now. So what color? What colors are they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like oh. a silvery purple. All right. <laughs> We're just making... Oh, goodness. This place making is... Happy times. This place yeah. is haunting. It's super messed up. I love it. Um, and then finally, what's something small but special that most of the inhabitants take for granted? Having grown up here... Because I, I think it's like it's it's been a process that's been happening for a while. Mm-hmm. And so like the, the current generation, like this is what they've grown up knowing... There is like a glowing moss that kind of grows over things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't give off a ton of light, but if it were absent, like you would notice a significant difference because there's so much of it. But it kind of okay. just grows all over everything, so you don't really think about it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. What's it okay. taste like? I think it's real tasty. Is it sweet? Well, mm. but like, is it sweet? Is it like I just want to know? Like glowing moss, a, duh. I don't know. I think it's okay. a little more of an umami you, you know, flavor. It's got like kind of a is? smoky flavor. It's like a. What does it taste it's like? like a, a, a. It's like a bonito Slurpee. <laughs> nice. That sounds yeah, so gross. fish flakes Slurpee. Um, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, and it's delicious. Um, but it melts in your mouth, kind of like cotton candy. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> like I don't a little, like little pop fish rock flavor sort of to melt in my mouth. Feel to it. Ew. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's certainly a thing. Um, now, given that we're not going to uh, to play these <laughs> characters, um, I still want like, what do we imagine the inciting event? What's the what's the cold open? for the game that we would play with these characters. I was going to say there's a leak somewhere. Oh, I want to, what, what if it one was, of my bubbles pops, um, one of the civilizations nearby mm. popped. Oh, and, and we have the a bunch last, of fish refugees. And the last thing we heard from the, the, you know, the so far echo channel, Mm-hmm. was that this this has happened and there's only a, so many people that were able to escape. Interesting. And but we're not sure whether to believe it or not because we've been getting all of these sort of like corrupted yeah. stories about things anyway that are getting progressively creepier. So mm-hmm. we have no clue if this is really true or not. Although I'm there. Yeah, both you and Bub are there. Well, you can't answer all of our questions. There have to be some unknowns, Ryan. I'm imagining that I don't have full perception of what's, you know, totally above me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just what's near the surface. And I can probably tell that something has happened. It'd probably even be cooler if, like, you normally know everything. But for, like, the one time you just don't. Oh, yeah. like, hey, listen, I don't have an answer for you. It's like, what what if it not only popped the bubble, but it severed my connection to mm-hmm. myself in that like location that. so now there's just a dark hole 
Mm-hmm. It's like oh. the only place on the surface of the planet that I can't feel. Yeah. Yeah. And like that that like if we had an opening, you know, like 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 I said if it was a cold open, we would have just this image of like the bubble collapsing and like your consciousness in the you know where we're all together like just going dark and apart and like everybody being like what and then you see like all the inhabitants like rushing through the bubble tunnels as they're collapsing until they get to you know the next closest city yeah oh all right (laughs) happy times yeah yeah i'm guessing a few casualties came from that too oh yeah Ugh. it's fine yeah, fine. This, this is the this is the the thanks I hate it, but I also love it. So. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I feel that way all, about this game all the time. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, why did we why did we do that to ourselves? Because there was, I mean, you asked some questions. There was nothing here. We did all mm-hmm. of this to yep. ourselves. Raise the stakes. Um, yep. But I like that this game sort of makes you do that. It makes you play in that space of like making things bad for yourself sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like just the 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 winds are gonna be that much cooler with this. Like when when you figure out what's going on and mm-hmm. when we're able to push back against it, it's gonna feel great. Yeah. All right. All right. Should we move into our discussion section? I think we should. Yeah. All right. D twenty for your thoughts. All right. So in this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it feels in this system compared to others. But first, we'd like to ask you how you got into role-playing games in the first place. Richard, okay. I was going to say, Richard, first, my, my answer is long. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, I, will, I will give my answer then. Um, so in elementary school, I got bused to a different part of the city uh, because they had a cool math and science program, and now I'm writing math puzzles for kids so i guess it worked um but uh on that bus there were these three brothers who played um narrative story games they didn't call it that but that's what it was um and they invited me to play with them um and like one of my very earliest memories of gaming uh was playing a star trek game and we uh decided to go to warp and we had forgotten that the inertial dampeners uh were not working and so we pancaked ourselves against the back of the bridge um whoops yeah uh it was great um but uh but you know my older brother played um D and and all those things and shadow run um and he was nine years older so when he was just getting into that in high school i was right at that impressionable age of going my brother's super cool and he's doing this super cool thing <laughs> um nice yeah, and now I get to to game with him and his high school friends. So it's it's pretty cool like making that transition to being like, "Oh, yes, I am sort of one of the the crew now." Um, you know, 25 years later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Taylor, I'm ready for your really long story. It goes back to when I was born. No, um <laughs> but pretty <laughs> close there. Uh I learned how to talk and read. Uh, really early like I was talking in full sentences before I could walk Um, and one of my earliest memories is when I was like two years old uh, I finished my first book which was Hop on Pop Um, and like I remember running into like our sunroom with the the little tiny hardcover book my dad was taking a nap and I just wailed it on his head and I and I yelled I read it (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, and I really got hooked into choose your own adventure books, uh, in like preschool and kindergarten and none of my friends could read. So what I would do is gather a group of like four or five friends at recess and I would read through these books and we went through uh, all of them that my library had. And so I just started making them up. Uh, and so I would make up like choose your own adventure stories and like, we would, um, like tell stories of, uh, like boy detectives and, uh, we, like we were all really into Watership Down cause I also brought that and read it, which is a great thing for a bunch oh, of geez. preschoolers to like, 
<laughs> um, Yikes. Yeah, so like that was just this thing that I had like started doing and it wasn't anything like weird or special because like I was like, hey, this is a way for me to like make make recess fun and and entertain my friends. Uh and this was like the one skill that I had that people thought I was cool for some reason. Um and so flash forward a few years uh and I was at a summer orchestra camp with some friends. And we were looking for things to do because we had some like open time. And I said, well, I can, you know, I can run us through like a choose your own adventure book story. And everyone looked at me kind of weird. And we started doing it. And I was like into uh, some like fantasy video games. So I did like a wizards and sorcery kind of deal. And one of my friends goes, this is like Dungeons and Dragons. This is super fun. I had no clue what that was. (laughs) Uh, and so he brought the books the next day and we rolled up characters and I immediately grew frustrated being a player and not being the storyteller. So um, <laughs> I quote unquote borrowed his Dungeon Master's Guide and read it and I was the storyteller from then on. Nice. Yeah. That's really cool. It is really cool. Mm-hmm. I want to talk to both of you about your process for picking and creating characters in a game. How do you go about deciding what kind of character you want to make? I mean, and Taylor, it sounds like you don't make a lot of characters because you like to be in charge, but I assume you make a lot of NPCs then at least. I mean, I, I know yeah, my answer for, for this. Um, it's I have, I have a silly answer and a serious answer. Um, and my, my silly and flippant answer is that whatever silly pun I happen to have in my brain at the moment uh, is my character inspiration, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> which like uh, is actually a surprising number of times. Like it leads to really interesting places because, you know, you can start with a kernel of pretty much anything and, you know, given good world building questions and character building questions, it always turns into something interesting. Um, the, I guess, more serious answer would be, um, now, as opposed to, um, you know, growing up when it was just like, oh, cool. What, what cool powers have I not played with, um, in this system? Um, I think now it's, it's a lot more interesting for me to, to think about like what, what stuff am I dealing with, you know, Mm -hmm. um, like I've created uh, a couple of characters um, over the last couple of years who um, who are parents because that's not necessarily something that I think um, is in my future, um, but it is something that I think is interesting to explore um, from like an emotional place, um, and you know like dealing with you know like um, like I was talking about in the in the first episode of this this series you know like. Um, like how do I, how do I process the things that like, I wish were different about myself or my life or that like, you know, who could I be if I could be a different person? Um, and like, you know, finding, finding those places where it's like, what emotions can I explore that I don't get to explore in like my daily life? You know, Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a really I've talked about it. people are going to be so tired of hearing me say this, but I think that that's a thing that I really love about role playing games is that mm-hmm. it gives you that sort of safe space to explore those things. Because I think that we don't talk about the grief of not having things like we don't mm-hmm. get a chance to mourn the loss of things that never were. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times in role playing games, that can be a thing that we do. We can take the time to say, this is a thing that never was, and I'm sad about it. I'm sad about this thing that I did not get to experience. Mm-hmm. Let me take some time and in this, you know, sort of gamified way, mm-hmm. get a moment to experience those things that I didn't get to or never will get to or whatever. Yeah. And I, I really like that it offers that kind of space to do those things in a way that is comfortable and confined and really that there aren't a lot of other opportunities to do. Yeah. And I mean, like, the other thing that I find really interesting for myself is, like, um, you know, I, I have a theater degree, right? Like, I, I've done the acting thing. And what I found for myself was that, like, 
that's something that I is it's too much of an emotional investment I think to to pursue it um as like a career or even to you know like when I'm 60 I will probably volunteer for a local community theater or something um Mm -hmm. you know when I'm retired but like there's so much energy and emotion and time and effort that you have to put into like portraying a a character who is like real you know and then you do the thing and then you walk away and it's like okay cool I did this thing and a bunch of strangers had two hours of you know a cool experience but then what's left you know Mm -hmm. um where I feel like with with gaming like you get this you, you get that same like thing where you can put yourself into this you know situation you can play this character um but because you're playing it with a smaller group of people who all like shared in that creation of that experience like you have a like a connection with those people now and like you know growing up i played a bunch a bunch of you know D and and you know like basically like you know video games that just happen to be on a table with some other people and you know let's go blow up this tank or whatever you know mm-hmm. whatever like, mm-hmm. um and and it wasn't like a transformative experience in the same way that i found like indie games have been like changed changing the way i look at things mm-hmm. um you know it, where, where it's like now i can walk away from something where i go okay i didn't have to you know spend three weeks learning lines and doing this production and blah blah blah, blah and then walk away with you know, basically nothing, um, with this, it's like, Oh, okay. Like I had an experience with these four people that I didn't know, you know, in the middle of the country where I don't live. And, you know, six months later, we're still talking about it. We're friends and we, you know, talk online every day now. And like, we can remember those things together. And like, um, I don't know. I, I feel like it, it hits a lot of those like moments for me where it's like, I need that, to have those emotional experiences and it's a cool way to like build friendships and it's a lot less like work than doing like theater, you know? (laughs) Um, So do you think that that is because you are getting that back and forth? Whereas like if you're on a stage, you are putting everything out and you are not getting a whole lot back and in a game you have that back and forth. Or do you think it's more related to the fact that you have some agency over the the things that you're putting your energy into rather than reading someone else's lines you are making your own decisions um or neither (laughs) i I don't know i i think like um because you're creating it at the table with other people it's like you're you're immediately invested um because like hey i created this yeah so it, it is it is a lot of that like hey i get to create this thing and and also like the you know the 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 game structure lets you sort of opt into the experience that you want in a two-hour chunk you know Mm -hmm. like if i go and i say okay i'm gonna go try out you know um i don't know no thank you evil right um like i'm going into that and going okay this is going to be like a fun simple game that you know i could probably play with like you know some young kids and it'll be cool and it'll be fun and light and happy or you know i can go okay i can go play some cthulhu whatever right and it's like okay but that's like i can go into that experience i can put in you know x amount of effort and get what i want out of it and if i don't like it it's like okay it's not a big loss and if i do like it and it was really cool well i had this cool experience with people and also like the the rules sort of structure that interaction as well you Mm -hmm. know um and, you know, for myself, like, yeah, okay, I've, I've done acting and things like that. Um, I am bad at, at uh, improving things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, I, given the choice to describe what my character is doing or, like, drop into something in character, I will almost always default to describing what's going on. Um, because I'm like, I'm still that very much that shy kid who, you know, like didn't talk to people until like junior year of high school. So even though I did a bunch of acting and things like that was a stretch for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times I will still default to, you know, uh, yeah. And I, 
<laughs> I, I want to butt in here and say that like third person narration, I think, is a perfectly valid form of like role playing. Like not everyone, I think, expecting mm-hmm. everyone oh, to yeah. like have an improv degree and just be like, I am only speaking in character <laughs> for the entirety of this four hour session is ridiculous. Are yep. there people mm-hmm. who do that and have fun? Yeah. Sure. Is it great audio to listen to? Absolutely. Yep. But is it something that I'm expecting of everyone mm-hmm. who's sitting at my table? Hell no. Do I like doing it? Hell no. Right. Like I am much more of a third per like third person narration. Like we are telling a story together. We're not acting it out together, but it's still gonna be badass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um was actually as I'm flipping through my notebook, I took some notes while I was at a panel at uh, Gen Con last year. Um, that Drew Marzieski did talking about um, acting for role playing, and it was he had a point in there too that is, you know, like you can do a couple different levels. You can just say this thing happens, you know, or you can describe what happens or you can be in character. And all of those things are valid levels and all of those things are kind of appropriate at different times and, you know, can add different levels of comfort. But especially when we listen to a lot of like actual play podcasts, there's this feeling that I have to be like constantly in character and constantly on Mm -hmm. and charismatic and, for me, I'm not as good at that part of it. I I do better with those sort of descriptive narrative kind of a th- kind of things, and I feel much more comfortable in that zone. I'm trying to branch out a little bit, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If that is mm-hmm. where you are comfortable, games are supposed yeah. to be fun. Do what is fun. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, the funny thing for myself I've found is that like if it's a normal interaction or something relatively mundane, like I, I hesitate away from it. But if it's like the, the this is a crucial moment where I need to tell you like all the the pain that my character is suffering. Oh, I will one hundred percent do that in character. You know, mm-hmm. because it's like I want to feel that. Yeah. Um. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess to answer from my perspective, when I create characters, <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my answer is going to be a lot quicker and a lot shorter and a lot more self-indulgent. It's because when I create characters, I think about who I would most likely have a crush on in whatever game we're playing, and then Ooh. I make them. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, <laughs> good. We, just, like, we just aired the most recent episode of Protein City Comics, uh, which, hey, I guessed it on. Um, mm. And my character on that That's is so like good. this like weird lithe cat boy from space um Mm -hmm. and he is like the competing heir (laughs) to this bodyguard like family i guess and he's got a lot of drama with his boyfriends and it's like yeah i would fall in love with this horrible fictional character (laughs) and dream about him (laughs) and make pinterest boards and like Mm -hmm. title playlists and weird like image edits that's the kind of characters that I like to make. It's completely self-indulgent and gay, and I love it. Well, it's great. Do it. That's beautiful. It. Oh, one thing I, I forgot to mention for mine is the the other character strategy I have is, hey, what's my biggest insecurity? Let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. That's a fun one. Awesome. Well, then let's talk a little bit more about uh, Descent into Midnight compared to other games. How do we think the character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that we've uh, played or created characters? I think for? it's the second best character creation system that has ever been devised. Um, the first best is, of course, this Ooh, is a that, game about a fishing by one Taylor Labreche. Uh, <laughs> wait, who now? Arguably, never maybe heard of first him. First or second best? I don't know. It's a toss up. Uh, <laughs> Now, wait, wait, where can we find this person's games? <laughs> uh, DescendantToMidnight.com is the best place to go ah. for a game that he worked on <laughs> with uh, two other designers, uh, Richard Kreutzlandry and Rich Howard. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I am Same completely game. unbiased and objective when I say that this is one of the best character creation systems in the entire world. Hmm. So can I ask, in, I mean, in your humble opinion why 
I mean, it, so yes. it is PBTA. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it does have a lot of things in common. And we talked in a previous episode about how you feel like it owes a lot of things to mm-hmm. the way Masks does things. Yeah. And um, we talked about uh, Pasión de las Pasiones. Um, so, I mean, do you think that there are things that Descent into Midnight brings to the character creation process that we don't find in other PBTA games? Or um, do you feel like it fits that mold pretty well and that's just like a, a system that really works? Mm, I, I've i got some thoughts Go on it. this, if you don't mind, Taylor. Okay. So um, one of the pieces of feedback that we've had pretty consistently from the beginning um, is that this is a game where, you know, we... we we have this, you know, the the tagline of, you know, we're exploring the depths of the sentient mind, right? So mm-hmm. we're getting in those aquatic puns and everything, even right there in the tagline. Um, but I, you know, at first, I thought, man, that sounds pretentious as hell, right? <laughs> um, or, uh, you know, and like, but... But what I've I've come to, to to realize is that people have have very much like responded to that um, in that you know you get to play a character that is distinctly alien, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you know Taylor likes to bring up that you know okay let's let's try and avoid that anthropomorphism um, where we can um, so that that's that's not a reference point, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think what it does is it lets you explore what's important about like humanity and emotions and connections with people without having a bunch of trappings um, of like, you know, like cultural baggage or like the, these other things or like, you know, like, oh, well, you look like this or, or anything like that. It's just like, okay, if, if, if I'm a fish, and you are, you know, like the life force of the ocean and, you know, you're a, a weird thing that exists in the dimension next door and pops in to say hello every thousand years. Like, what do you do with that? It's like, well, the only thing left to you is like to explore like, OK, well, what are, what are the connections between these um these sapient beings look like Mm -hmm. and you know like what matters to them and you know so many i think like we owe a lot like we said to like masks and and other powered by the apocalypse games where there's a lot of freedom to define yourself and the questions or the options sort of give you some direction as far as like you know hey here's some some roads you can go and sort of imply a lot Um, but I think what we're doing that has really resonated with people is giving people, um, you know, a super blank canvas, Mm -hmm. um, that encourages them like, Hey, don't just do, you know, a mermaid or a person who swims or a sea elf or something like do something that is weird and interesting to you, um, and then really put yourself in the shoes of something that is very different from yourself and figure out what makes sense. You know, what, what's the things in, that you have in common or what are the experiences that you can like share with that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, again, like it, it's, it's, I don't think the mechanisms are different than any other powered by the apocalypse game for for the most part you know it's hey here's a list of options Mm -hmm. you know instead of powers and masks we have gifts uh which can be you know whatever but like the the overall thing that you're building is something that is alien but the goal is to create you know a a a being that will then connect with other people in like interesting ways and emotional ways Mm -hmm. and that's the thing that's like the the key piece you know yeah, I, I was thinking about this after we recorded the character creation session for this um, because Descent into Midnight character creation was a huge inspiration for my game. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my game and, and Descent into Midnight, they, they both have evolved their character creation a bit uh, to be uh, something quite remarkable. And I was like, I can get some really cool stuff with my game, but I can't get what we get out of Descent to Midnight because you have more of a blank slate that 
allows you to literally open up your imagination to literally anything right <laughs> pretty much yeah and and it's a game about aliens and exploring mm-hmm. an alien mind from the perspective of a human which mm-hmm. is just so remarkable when you dive headfirst into it no pun intended mm-hmm. um and just really embrace the concept of creating an alien creature in an alien world. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think you get to drop a lot of those preconceived notions yeah. and stereotypes, and like it allows you to have a lot of freedom. And like, there are no tropes, you know. I mean, and you obviously mm-hmm. you can bring some of those yeah. like storytelling tropes into things, mm-hmm. but like there are no, there are no stereotypes there. It's just yeah, it's open, and you know, the only preconceived notion that you can come in with is, hey, everything here is wet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so beyond that, it leaves a lot of room. Mm-hmm. And I, I think one of the cool things about it, too, is like, you know, we – like I was saying, it's like, hey, if you're going to be a fish and I'm going to be an octopus and this person's going to be, you know, a, a life force or echolocation or whatever, like, there is, there is no excuse for bringing in, like, negative things – that you like don't want to it's like you know it, it's not like you know D D, right well it's like well going around and killing the the savages is just what we do mm-hmm. because it's D D, right like which <laughs> um mm-hmm. you know um with this it's like hey there is there is a problem and it can be emotional or it can be you know an existential threat or whatever and it's like uh, <laughs> it lets you bring in whatever you want and like address the things like on your terms Mm -hmm. as a group to say, Hey, these are the types of conflict that we want to face. And like, literally you build the corruption out together to say, Hey, what is the problem that we're going to face? You know? And, and like that knowledge of, Hey, Mm -hmm. we're going to do this together as a community. Like, I think, I, I hope that it's, you know, allowing the players to like come together and do that in a healthy way to say, Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to face adversity, but we're going to define what it is. And we're going to, you know, choose this is how we battle it together, I guess. Did you ever explore, um, creating a world first before the characters? We did. Um, so it Uh, wasn't actually until pretty recently that we started character first and then drawing out the community that actually came, yeah. I think, you know, and I don't know that we ever codified that. So I'm sure, I'm sure that there exists yeah. games in the past where we did start with the characters and then the community <laughs> and vice versa. But mm-hmm. um, we didn't really say, hey, this is how it's supposed to be with a capital S and a trademark at the end right. um, until after we like slammed down the mechanics for that community map. Um and I would always yeah. run games saying like, hey, we're making the character first and then the community because it's not the story about the world. It's the story about our characters who live in a world. Mm-hmm. So it's important to mm-hmm. make that. But, you know, this is more important than, you know, whatever might be mm-hmm. out there. Yeah. And it's it's really interesting because the order completely matters in this mm-hmm. case because we, we made these very distinct characters and the world that we created was based around the characters themselves whereas Mm -hmm. if we built the world first our characters i guarantee would have been 100 Mm -hmm. percent different yeah i mean like you you can think about it like the cities came about because of who you know bub is yeah um the whole like oh there's this scary you know void ocean dead ocean all around like and all that i think one of the things that um rich was uh was pretty insistent about when we were talking about um like building the the inhabitants for the city was like hey we should um we should make sure that like the characters that you are playing are um part of a species in the world but they are not like the thing so like you know again going back to the the D thing it's like oh well 
a dwarf is a fighter with a big beard who has lots of hit points and an axe, right? Mm -hmm. Like an elf is an archer or a wizard, you know, whatever, like all that kind of stuff. Like we don't want it to be like, Hey, Oh, you are playing a shark. So every shark in this world is whatever you are, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and like the, the idea of, okay, well you are playing a, a character that is, among the species and and you know you're going to build out a little about a bit about like who they are and what they are well you have to know who your character is to then help build the world with them and like Mm -hmm. paint with that brush um and like in some of the games that he was running um like that that's how he was starting it out is hey okay let's build these characters and then let's let's you know populate the world with you know are you unique or are you a representative of this species and and like you know what what are some traits that you have that are common to your species and what do, you know, like what other things do they do? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I feel like that, that really helped because like, if you ask somebody, Hey, what's, what's a cool feature about this underwater city, right? You, You might get some, some like terrain, you know, you would start with some terrain or some feature and then you would kind of build out from there. And I, I feel like we, we've talked about the, there's always one with, you know, there's always one person who plays the, the really bizarre sort of out there concept. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like we've gotten more really interesting characters by starting out with a blank slate and just asking about like, you know, picking those, those descriptors and the gifts and everything, And then going, okay, based on that, let's go build the city together where you are an integral part of it. Um, You know, because again, like we said here, like Bub would have been something completely different had we, you know, said, oh, okay, well, there's just a reef. Now what? You know? So within that, I'm talking about all of the different things that you can do within character Mm -hmm. creation and community creation. Are there things that you feel like are flaws of this game still or things that you're, I mean, cause obviously you're still doing some play testing too, mm-hmm. like things that you are still working out, you know, like wrinkles that you haven't figured out or things that you think that maybe you never quite will. Yeah. I think, and I don't, I hesitate to call it a flaw because um, I don't think that it's like a bad thing, but like <laughs> this game will not serve everyone who tries to play it. And I think where oh, yeah. it might, Hot take games shouldn't because yeah. not everything's for everyone. Um, <laughs> like I, I've seen people have difficulty making characters in Descent to Midnight who struggle with making like on the snap decisions. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not a game where you are choosing like a big, huge list of options. Like at most, if you look at like our lists or our looks and gifts, like there's like three or four. And those are intentionally vague because it supports the kind of play that I love where you see that there's always one, like, I am the interconnectedness of all living things. And I got that because I'm enlightened mm-hmm. and encrusted, like, whatever. Um, it's not mm-hmm. gonna it's not going to support people who are looking for a system like Dungeons & Dragons where it says, you are one of these three specific things, and then you can, like extrapolate your character from that it asks you to do some of that work up front Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i do know that i'm the kind of person who tends to need a box Mm -hmm. to work within that Mm -hmm. i get kind of stressed out when i'm just given a blank page i will say that one of the things that helps me with that and a thing that has sort of made this game okay for me is being around the table doing Mm -hmm. it with other people Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I I mean, people who have listened to our character creation episodes can kind of hear me hem and haw about things and just say, like, I don't know what to do. I don't really know what I want. I have no clue where I'm going, whatever. And having other people around to kind of bounce ideas off of and say, okay, I can kind of see the world that we're creating and I can kind of pull from this thing that you're doing or someone else is doing helps me a lot. But I do think there are definitely people that have a hard time with some of those like broader open spaces. Mm -hmm. And as much as I love this game, I am one of those people. And every time I've sat down to play this game, I've had a moment of like, Oh crap, I don't even know where to start. Um, And you know, that can be like a little bit stressful. I like this game enough to say, Oh, well I'll figure it out. And I've played it enough times now too, to be like, okay, I know, I know it'll be fine. Um, But yeah, definitely that can be a little bit tough and 
you know, I think you're right. I don't think it's necessarily a flaw. It's certainly by design that it does that. But mm-hmm. that is a thing that, well, yeah, I agree. Like, even I sometimes have a hard time with. And I, I will say that, like, growing up playing, uh, you know, more traditional games, uh, being in the GM seat or the, sorry, the 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 seat of the guide for this game right Mm -hmm. like it's especially if you're doing a one shot at a con and it's like okay we're we're building characters in the first hour 45 minutes or whatever we're gonna take five minutes and i'm just gonna put together the start of a story with maybe an end point somewhere in Uh and we'll see what happens is terrifying yeah um but i've i don't think i've ever had a bad game running it you know several times Mm -hmm. um and like it's it's a little bit of a leap of faith and i think you know that could be intimidating for um for someone who's relatively new to running games um you know um and again i don't think that's necessarily like a flaw of the game Mm -hmm. it's just how it is for you know pbta in general i think well, I think it's nice too because uh, PBTA and, and this game especially relies heavily uh, every time I've played it on the, the other people at the table, not just the guide, to come yeah. up with it, not only uh, what's going on around you, but situations that uh, and maybe even escalating the situation in, of sorts uh, and figuring yeah. out what to do from there. Uh, so it's it's a lot of back and forth collaborating from the start to finish i like it but yeah it's terrifying <laughs> <laughs> i haven't run descent to midnight yet but i run chimera pretty much the exact same way and it is terrifying mm-hmm. are we ready for my favorite part of the show it's the fan fiction section where we get to talk about how we think this game would go um how do we think that our group works together how would we how would we do in this game um how do we think it would play out oh gosh um i want to lose so badly like yeah <laughs> I, like, I want to experience I, like going through all the trials and tribulations and failing i feel like in this in this particular setting with this particular group i i 100 percent agree with you like i would want to experience the the struggles of like you know like exploring the the void a bit you know and and like especially as like the redeemed um where a lot of them is like trying to hold back their their anger and and like the the negative emotions you know like i can just imagine like playing that arc of them like trying to hold it together as everything crumbles around them and like getting those wins and coming together with everyone and then ultimately just like watching everything crumble away as like one by one until there's nothing left but um between men you know like yikes yeah it, well and i think two of the the hardships that I picked for my character, like the things that I just don't quite get were anguish and despair. Yeah. And so I really want room to kind of explore those and have to come to terms with those Mm -hmm. things. And I like the idea of just this sort of like desperation and devastation and the realization that like sometimes you can't fix things. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think it would be... Which, I mean, is, is rough. Um... But that's why I think it would be super interesting if you were like, like literally the 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 queen of the city at least, like the mm-hmm. the figurehead, the ruler that that is supposed to keep people safe, mm-hmm. and yeah, all of your resources, everything that you throw at it, it's still not enough, and coming yeah. to that realization, you know, yeah, I gotta like hope that there's some fix at the end though, like I. I and this I, might I just be like some that. like player calibration because like I like Descent to Midnight <laughs> when it's like really emotional and very passionate, mm-hmm. but yeah, not necessarily in a despairing I... sense. Like I love it when when games like get really intense and super emotional, but then like the message of the story is like through these disasters, comma like a crucible. Mm-hmm. Like this is the forge I... that 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 presses the diamond into shape i think like especially with this group like 
I, I can imagine that like we would lose mm-hmm. and then we would have like, like, I, I don't know. I can imagine like the physical world sort of collapsing in on itself until there was almost nothing left. And, and but then the there, uh, yeah, exactly. But like the pearl becomes a new physical reality as like we ban like, learns from it and can like recreate like a whole new world i think would be really cool like the pearl is like a stabilizing entity for everything i like the idea that like it you know it does all come collapsing in on itself but the realization and sort of acceptance that that wasn't bad Mm -hmm. um and it's sort of like almost like a metaphor for death i guess in the way that it's like it is somewhat inevitable but that doesn't mean it has to be bad or scary yeah that there are ways to sort of control your part of it and to you know kind of come to terms with those things and be at peace with things that are going to happen anyway and maybe that's just like where i'm at right now Mm. in my life because i've just finished a ton of dialectical behavioral therapy a lot of which focuses on you can't change everything and you are not in charge. Mm -hmm. And so like the idea of having to come to terms with things and just like, they call it like sitting in with your discomfort and just like letting things be bad and being okay Mm -hmm. with that. Um, And then also like accepting things and like the sort of peace that you feel when you get there. It's like the metaphorical like Armageddon scenario of there's a giant asteroid headed for the earth. We've thrown everything at it that we can. We cannot stop it humanity needs to accept that their time is done what does that look like sort of deal and everybody has like a big like nice dinner party and like just like your last glass of wine and Mm -hmm. yeah and i feel like that is and again maybe that's just where i'm at right now (laughs) but like i feel like that's what i would want from this interesting i can definitely picture that Yeah, and I mean, like, it's interesting, too, because it's, like, it can go either way, yeah. like, easily, you know? Um, and Yeah, I mean, we certainly could put everything toward it, and we could find a solution. And, you know, like, I think if that's the game that you you really wanted to play, like, you could... And, and I think those are, like, always the kind of important discussions to have at the table and feel out, Yeah, you know, what do people want? Because what we have, you know, what Ryan and I have described is a very specific kind of game that really probably isn't for everyone no. and, you know, could really be very uncomfortable and very, you know, leave you feeling just really kind of icky at yeah. the end. Um, yeah. But if that's the experience that you want, mm-hmm. then you can kind of walk away feeling, like, satisfied and at peace and, yeah. you know. And, and normally I would be in the, like, I want a really hopeful game, even against mm-hmm. insurmountable odds. Yeah, I'm surprised you sided with me on that but, one. <laughs> right. I, I haven't experienced the, like, these sorts of, like, more dark type mm-hmm. games before. And that's a that's a space I'm opening myself up to right now. Where I want to, I want to let those like uh, really hard feelings in to my games, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's because Dirge still broke me. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I I've noticed that like as we've gone on with the show, like you have gotten more and more open to like these to like you know I don't want to say like my kind of games, but like I always <laughs> want these like heavy emotional experiences, yeah. and mm-hmm. you are always kind of coming to the table as more like. This is my fun yep. time. This is, you know, my time to like hang out with friends and I want to walk away feeling like energized, and not yeah. drained. <laughs> and I am here for the catharsis of having everything just ruined. I want to be stabbed in the um, heart and think the swordsman that does it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> effectively. Yeah. And then if you're Taylor, you want to also kiss him. So. <laughs> I mean, sounds like a good time, right? Like Right? Sounds like a great game. <laughs> But I, I think also, like, to, to Taylor's point, like, you know, uh, I know we talked about it last time, but, like, the with the sort of one-shot um, structure, you know, there's very much that, like, okay, let's, you know, hit the ground running and push hard and, you know, make everything terrible. Yeah. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, like, again, this could be a really interesting, like, 
hopeful resurgence yeah. of like pushing back the boundaries of the echo and learning to like mm-hmm. understand it and figure out what it was that was, you know, um, like pushing in on the physical world and making things so still and sort of like coming to peace with that. And, you know, like, what is it that, um, you know, like where have Shelley's people gone? Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, figuring out things like, you know, like if they did leave and they did release their hold on the physical world, like what, what does that look like? And I think there'd be some really interesting ways to explore that. Um, I think that I'd like to explore the idea that, you know, like that we are the corrupting factor, that it's not this thing outside, but we are, you know, we have sort of made our space within it and not, you know, taken into account you know what the echo needs or Mm -hmm. whatever that like we are the corrupting factor here and we you know like how do we need to change to fit in Mm -hmm. with the rest of this ecosystem i I think it could easily culminate into a situation where there was too many civilization pockets Mm -hmm. and the like spreading of civilizations has like weakened the echo to the point where it started pushing mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so gathering everybody into a singular space and creating just one singular bubble within that space mm-hmm. might be enough. So it's not as diluted. Yeah, it might be enough where the, the echo will slipstream past this one bubble and not be turbulent because of all the multiple bubbles out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oof. Yeah, I can see that working. So I think that this is a good place to talk about, you know, like leveling mm-hmm. up and advancement, you know, Richard, because you brought up mm-hmm. how games kind of go differently depending on whether you're playing this one shot mm-hmm. or a longer game. So maybe now is a good time to go ahead and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So I want to talk about how character advancement works in this game because i've only played it as a one shot i haven't gotten the chance to actually level up in the game so how does that work uh taylor do you want to talk about yeah so in this there are two kind of ways of like quote unquote leveling up and i'm still not like super comfortable calling it leveling up or advancement it's just like things happen and then more story happens um but there's not it's like the characters grow um so there's there's a harmonious way and then there's a corrupt way to advance um and both avenues uh represent different paths of your story um and ideally you know our design goal is that they will both be happening kind of at the same frequency um so as you engage with and resist and encounter and fight the corruption and learn more about the corruption um you will uh you know, move along a corruption tracker. When that corruption tracker hits five, you reset it and you get what's called a corruption move. Um, you can only take five of these total before, you know, bad things happen. Um, at max five, uh, you can choose to preemptively have bad things happen. Um, taking a corruption token or taking a corruption move means that there is a corruption token that is put immediately onto your community, but it also gives you something that, like another piece of mechanic. Um, and that mechanic is a one-time use ability that does um, like really big melodramatic uh, story with a capital S. Um, and that story, you know, may that story makes it much easier for you to enact your will upon your environment, but it comes at a cost either to yourself, the community, your friends. Um, it, it is a messy and entangled move. Um, mm-hmm. and you can use it once and then you mark it off. But then that, that tally is always and forever on you. You only get a limited amount of those. Um, Mm-hmm. And then on the flip side, uh, as you engage with your friends, as you heal the community, as you learn from your mistakes, uh, you gain what's called harmony. Um, and you have a harmony token or a harmony track as well. Uh, and when you fill your harmony track, you clear it. Um, you put in a harmony token on the community immediately. Um, 
and then you get to take an advancement. Uh, and these advancements are things like take another move from your playbook, take a, a move from another playbook, um, you know, your standard PBTA advancement fair. Um, and those are permanent. They are lasting, um, like, representations of your harmony. Uh, and that kind of split is intentional. We want the effects of harmony to be always and forever, uh, but we want the effects of corruption to be really intense but uh, impermanent. Mm. That's really cool. I love that so much. Yeah, I really like that balance. Anything else that you guys want to mention about this game before we um, wrap up? It's really good. And uh, I love that people are excited about how, like, dark and emotional it is. Um, I will say it makes me kind of uncomfortable that that's, like, the only through line that's being sold about this game. Um, Mm. We've literally had a game where our story was a Saturday morning cartoon. And we were, like, a bunch of snails trying to, like, (laughs) help our friend who was getting bullied by his older slug brother. Um, It Mm. is a game that, like, has... It it has that through line of emotional intensity, but it also mm-hmm. like ideally has a through line of hope and connectedness and like togetherness. Mm-hmm. Um, so I encourage more. Yeah, yeah. I will say our discussion <laughs> is heavily colored by the fact that like those are the kinds of games that I like to play and the people yeah. that I have played with. Um, but I know when I was playing my second game at Gen Con, Taylor, I think you were running one at the same time, and I could hear everybody like in the next room over laughing hysterically, which was not right. what was happening in my <laughs> game. But I, it can go both ways, and I think it really depends on who mm-hmm. you have at the mm-hmm. table and mm-hmm. you know like we talked about the kind of game yeah. that you want to play and so yeah i do think it's important that like it can be dark and creepy mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be i'd love to explore that's just like a slice of life type of uh session in one i don't know that we could do worlds. slice of life because i don't think that our mechanics are really like set up for mundanity and that i think like i say mm-hmm. mundanity in a really great way because that's what slice of life thrives on and that's like my big selling yeah. point for mm-hmm. slice of life um, but I don't think that Descent into Midnight does mundane stories very well. The corruption can't just be like... I mean, it can, way. but like, <laughs> it's food poisoning <laughs> to the point where that is your entire civilization's like existential like thing that they are dealing with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I'll, like we were saying, like the the amount of like con one-shots that we've been running for it um, have have very much like i think those have been the experiences that people have been walking away with um and uh you know like the in the mechanics like there there are the things there for like the the team moves um Mm -hmm. like all of the sort of you know uh uh you know solving um and like sort of like coming together it's it's all there and a lot of a lot of I think the the connections and the positivity are coming from the interactions that you're having um, when you're sort of reflecting on what's been going on and you know sort of the costs of um, you know having to do what you have to do to fight the corruption and and like the the discussions around like when you're placing the harmony tokens um, would you get as you advance that track like those are the things that. Um, you know, haven't come up as often in those games Mm -hmm. to be like, Oh, okay. Like here's this corruption that that we fought and we did a thing because we have to get through a story in two hours. But like, how did, you know, how does the community heal? Like what, you know, what does it look like as, you know, whatever corruption it is, like has been pushed back in this area. How does it, you know, how does it regrow? How do the relationships between people heal? Mm -hmm. Like all of those things, um, you know, are, are super important, but they're not necessarily the first thing that jumps out at you when you're reading through the moves and go, Ooh, here's some juicy corruption. You know what I mean? Um, (laughs) and yeah, I I think a lot of those would come out in longer play. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to get the chance to kind of explore some of the, um, advancement options. And I think mm -hmm. like, you know, dealing with those things that happen afterwards and like, how do you rebuild a community after something like that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I want to hopefully get a chance to explore some of that kind of stuff too and mm-hmm. see where the where the game goes with that because as much as I love to like burn it down, I am excited <laughs> at the chance to like maybe build it back up mm-hmm. afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I like how in one shot it can really hit you with that emotional gut punch, but you can kind of do that at the beginning of a campaign and then 
balance that out with all the hopeful stuff. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can start with that gut punch and be like, okay, now how do I recover yep. from this? Yeah. Very cool. Well, Taylor and Richard, thank you both so much for joining us to talk about Descent into Midnight. This was really amazing. Yeah, thanks so much for having us um, on. Yeah. Definitely. Can you go ahead and remind everyone uh, where they can find you online and what sort of things you're working on? Absolutely. So folks can find me on Twitter at Leviathan Files. They can find my games at riverhousegames.itch.io. Um, and I just want to give a shout right now until the end of Metatopia. I'm running a half off sale to get me to the conventions that I'm going to, essentially. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it, it, I mean... I have a goal on there uh, of like $1,500, which sounds like a lot. But if you realize that I have to like fly to these places and buy hotels and it's not cheap to, to do any of that stuff, um, nope. please tell your friends about all of the games. Uh, and then you can also find like <laughs> a big one that I'm working on at DescentIntoMidnight.com. Uh, that game is called Descent Into Midnight and it's very good. <laughs> Taylor, you I, also have a podcast. Oh, sh- I do. Um, it's called Game Closet, and it's an informal chat show with queer and LGBT plus tabletop role players, role de- game designers, archivists, podcasts, all of that. And it's very Thank good. You. <laughs> That's a very good show, and it, it gives me a lot of feelings. Oh, yeah, me too. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard, what about you? All right. So I am Richard Kreutz Landry. You can find me on Twitter at rkreutz Landry, R K R E U T Z L A N D R Y. Uh, you can also find my origami and a little bit of tiny game design work at origamigaming.com. Um, and then if you're looking for Rich Howard, the third member of our trio, uh, you yes, can find... who will not get his t-shirt because he's not on the episode, Mm-mm. but... <laughs> Uh, he is at Umbral Walker, um, on Twitter and, uh, he runs, uh, he co-hosts, uh, Whelmed, the Young Justice Files with, uh, Emily Booza and, um, does a bunch of other stuff, uh, but is kind of one of the, the aquatic gaming, I don't even know the word, uh, experts, yeah, notable people. yeah, notable folks. Um, so definitely look him up. Yeah, and we'll put a link to his stuff in our show notes, too, because we love mm-hmm. Rich. He's just, mm-hmm. I mean, he's just wonderful. Um, and I wish that he could have come on this episode, too, but, you know, he's got a weird schedule. Mm-hmm. So uh, fix that, Rich, if you're listening to this. <laughs> uh, fix your schedule, man, so that you can come get your T-shirt. <laughs> Thank you, both of us, for sitting down with us to do this. I'm so glad that we finally got to talk about this game. Um, and thank you to everybody else for tuning in. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune music for this episode is used with a creative commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from further information can be found within the show notes our main theme music is hero remix by steve combs and is used with a creative commons license this podcast is owned by us under creative commons this episode was edited by amelia antrim further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like All My Fantasy Children.
Each week, Aaron Catano Saez and Jeff Stormer take a listener submitted prompt and, using some of their favorite tabletop RPGs, create an original fantasy character. Along the way, they share laughs, stories, verbal hugs, and populate a shared universe one story at a time. I click. I've got waveform friends. I've got all sorts of waveforms. Nice. Don't know much about <laughs> So there's this all books one. Is that all the books? Uh, yes, it is all ten Oops. of them. Hey, that's a good one to reference. Oops, all tips and strings. Sorry, my, my cottage neighbor um, stopped by like... 20 minutes before 7.30, well, 7.10 then, I guess. Um, and he was like, oh, I wanted to see the the the, the bolt motors that you have hanging in your garage because I think there's somebody that might be interested in them. I want to get the numbers off of them. I'm like, okay. That took nearly 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, my God, my teeth's getting cold. Mm. <laughs> and I have so to they, they have um, app-enabled electronic temperature control mugs that we saw the other day while what? we were at Best Buy. <laughs> and I was like, that is so extra. Like, yeah. I can't wait for someone to hack the internet of things to make my tea cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> uh-huh. Or or you, you get your, your kid's temp uh, hot chocolate that suddenly turns, you know, scalding hot. Yeah. Because, yes. Oh, I want to play this game. <laughs> Here's the thing, Ryan. You can. <laughs> but how? <laughs> I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> we have a website. Oh. It's descentintomidnight.com. What? You can find all of our information, including a live playtest packet, online. Wow. Tell me but more. Wait, there's more. What? <laughs> You can also, in addition to playing this game, give us playtest feedback. Wow. Can I? There's a f- Absolutely you can. <laughs> there is a form that you can fill out right now answering some simple questions about your experience reading or playing Descent it to Midnight. Oh, man. I need to get all over that. It's good. <laughs> it just... <laughs> Did you ever see that episode of Animaniacs where they're going around trying to get people to take the surveys? Mm-mm. would you like to take a survey and they go around and they're pestering people and it's uh <laughs> it's classic that's awesome <sighs> oh man i'm i haven't seen that show in decades yeah it it doesn't necessarily age well but it was a lot of fun <laughs> at the time yeah uh. well that's just silly yeah. well how about this Let's, I mean, the rest of us all have a thing, so we could yeah, I'll, you could count down in your track. Yeah, and then, I'll do a three, two, one yeah. countdown, and then you just click, and I'll just line that up. How's that sound? Because you did miss some quality content. Yeah, no kidding. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, clicky. Okay. That's a very That's distinct waveform. I've never recorded that on my Audacity before. Well, yeah, because you always do it before <laughs> we record. I know. All right. 37 minutes later, we are ready. Excellent. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) That's all right. (laughs) Okay. So, um, any questions before we start? I can't say all language on this podcast, can I? You cannot. Well, (laughs) all language. (laughs) You can get it all out now, or you can wait until the end. We recorded with John Adamus, and he held it in, and I was really proud of him. And then it was two minutes straight. Are you what? ready? Heck. Heck. Yeah. Yeah, what the heck? Yeah. G. Willikers. Good golly. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about a different play? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know that I love Cheaper by the Dozen enough that that would be... <laughs> <laughs> be like, I mean, oh, it's the- bad, but it's worth it. <laughs> The one thing it had going for it is it had a huge cast and uh, lots touche. of female roles mm. with just a couple of guys. So, yeah, you know. that works. Well, there you go. Yeah, Welcome to the- Curtain Cast, where we draw the shade on all your favorite movies. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, yeah, no kidding. Uh, it's 
good tagline, too. <laughs> so welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters. The best part of role-playing <laughs> <Hey> games. <you. laughs> That's our job. <laughs> it's color-coded, it says, right at the top. Color-coded. Except that one time we I don't didn't like rules. To, we didn't want to do that. Remember, we forgot to switch the... Like, we didn't want to switch the colors back, and then we were so confused. <laughs> <laughs> they yep. couldn't handle that I wasn't purple. Yep. I I have to say that a, a little tiny part of me is is glad that uh, I'm I'm winning the t-shirt race against Rich. I think at this point, right? Like, has he been on yet? He's been he on has. once. He yep. did Blue Planet. Oh, okay. So we're t- we're tied now. We're tied now. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> what is this t-shirt race? Uh, when we first did our survey to see like if people were interested in being on the show and what kind of games they wanted to talk about. Rich Howard filled out our survey seven times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I forget if oh, seven goodness. was the number, but we said at some point after you'd been on so many times, you would get a T-shirt. Yeah, I think, so it, was, I think it was six, six appearances. Yeah, we six gave him one, one, one appearance of Wiggle Room. Yes. So y'all know that I've written like 20 games, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm sure at least six of those have character creation <laughs> in them. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you can beat Rich to the T-shirt. <laughs> exactly. We actually have fit. T-shirts make now, too. <laughs> That's true. And we lost Taylor. Oh no! Oh, we did. No, he's still here. It's just, I mean, his video oh, okay. feed is still here. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, there he is. I put something in chat. Oh. I am going to, yeah, use this as an opportunity to like loudly drink things into the microphone. Oh, there you go. I'll, I'll see. I'm hoping that. that the microphone's not picking up the dog snores. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely yeah, some sort of underwater sound there. Yeah. Well, I had to kick the cat out because he will get all up in the business if he is not being paid attention to. That me. makes sense. Yeah, the dog has to be in here because otherwise she sits outside the door and moans until mm. I Aww. open it. Um, <laughs> even though there's six other people in this house, mm-hmm. she has to sit outside my door. She's outside the door every morning when I get up waiting for me. Aww. That's loyalty. I won't let her sleep in here because she gets up at four. Ugh. Yikes. Yeah. I'm not about that. That's a bad time to get up. It is a bad time. You know what? I mean, to be completely honest, any time is a bad time to get up. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, maybe that's just personal preference. Hmm. There is no good time to wake up. Sorry about that. Welcome back. Oh, I'm muted. Okay, but I am back. All right. (laughs) And I'm sorry, I was interrupting Richard right when he was about to skewer how horrible I've been as a collaborator. <laughs> yeah, he said some nasty things about you while you were gone. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. It was really terrible, I'm sure. We'll, we'll make sure to cut those um, so nobody ever hears them but us. Yes. <laughs> I am recording. I am, with the waveforms, recording thereof. Gain's really low for some reason. Mine seems low, too. Hello? But I have I have not touched it. No, maybe it's just like not close enough to my mouth. I don't know. Hello, maybe microphone. Uh, hello. Oh, those are very jagged waveforms. Perhaps if I talk in a louder voice. Yeah, no, actually that was better. If I talk <laughs> like if I'm not like, hey Ryan, hey Amelia, quick. hey Ryan, welcome to series eighteen. Series eighteen, everybody, it's okay. It's okay. It's gonna be fine. Not Just stressed. curl up with a blanket and have some nice hot cocoa and listen to our story of fish horn. Okay. <laughs> yep, it'll be fine. Okay, let us blow your minds just a little bit. Okay, all right, here we go. I'll do a five count. <laughs>